Element Church. Come on, is it good to be in church on Easter Sunday morning? I got to test the church folk and see if we know it. He is risen. All right. That was okay. I think first service may have been a little better, but I still love y'all. Still got love for you guys. Hey, uh, we're so glad you're here. So glad you decided to worship with us on Easter Sunday. Uh, I first and foremost want to speak to any first-time guests. Element Church, how do we feel about our first-time guests? Come on, we love y'all. So grateful you decided to come worship with us this morning. Uh, I want to invite you to partner with us in one of two ways. You can either scan the QR code that you'll see up on the screen, or you can take the connection card from the seat back in front of you and take some time to fill that out. What this does is it gives us a unique opportunity to connect with everybody God's bringing through our doors. And so we love that you've taken time to come worship with us. I also want to mention if you take that connect card to the Welcome Center out in the front, we'll get you some free goodies, and everybody loves free goodies. Amen? I know I love free goodies. A couple of exciting events coming up here at Element Church that I also want to make sure you get on the calendar and you prioritize on your schedule because you're not going to want to miss them. We have our women's event, our sisterhood event. Do I have any ladies in the room? I'm telling y'all, my own mother will drive three hours to make it to these sisterhood events. Why? Because they're amazing. There's going to be powerful worship, powerful preaching, uh, great food. And whether you're a man or a woman, we all love great food. And the whole church said, amen. Come on. We can't be lying in church, especially on Easter Sunday. So uh, you definitely want to come out. If you want more info on our sisterhood event, you can go to elementchurch.com forward slash sisterhood and get all the details and information you need there. Next thing I want to announce, we have our Summer Kids Day Camp coming up. This is for kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, it, the dates are July 15th through the 18th. Now, if you have a kindergartner or a four-year-old, those are half days for that demographic. But for the first through sixth graders, uh, those are going to be f four full days. And so not only are your kids going to receive the Word of God, not, are they, are, not only are they going to grow in their walk with Jesus, but they're going to have a ton of fun while they're doing it. And I also know as a parent of toddlers, I'm grateful for Summer Kids Day Camp and all the parents said, amen. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Element Church. Uh, final announcement that I want to make and share with you guys. Element Church, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be doing something brand new. And this is for whether it's your first time visiting or you've been at Element Church for some time. We're going to be hosting what we call is a connect class. And that name's perfect because the intention of the class is really to connect with God, to connect with others, and to connect with Element Church. Maybe you've uh, been coming for some time and you're looking to get more connected in the church. You have questions. You're not sure about some things. At our Connect class, you'll learn about the background of Element Church, the foundation of Element Church, what we believe as a church. You'll also have the unique opportunity to ask any questions that you might have. And so again, this is for everybody. It's a two-session class. First session is April 21st. Second session is going to be April 28th. Make sure you prioritize being there. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Now I have a favor to ask of everybody in the room. Uh, I know we like our personal space, we like our elbow space, but as people continue filing into the room, it would be helpful for us if you guys would scooch together. Now, last service I said smooch together, and that's not what I want you to do. I don't want you to smooch together. I want you to scooch together. So if you could move in a seat or two, it would be incredibly uh, appreciated by Element. So, hey, uh, last thing I want to make mention of, there are some bright lights and flashing lights. If you're sensitive to those things, just want to make sure you have an awareness. But, uh, yeah, we're so glad you're here. We'll be getting Easter at Element started in about a minute. Are y'all ready for service? Come on. It's going to be awesome.
Oh
Happy Easter, everyone. 
So glad you're with us. I want to welcome everybody watching in Fireside, several hundred people in there. So glad you're with us. Everybody in St. Charles, Warrington, and the thousands watching online around the world, welcome to Element Church as we celebrate Easter. <laughs> Quick house cleaning announcement for those that are wondering. This is not pink, it's salmon. So guys, you can quit judging me, uh, and I make it look good. You're welcome. <laughs> so glad you're with us. I know we have so many guests with us this weekend, and maybe this is your first time here at Element Church. It's probably a little bit different than maybe what you experienced growing up in church. One thing I can guarantee you is you will not fall asleep at Element Church. And we believe in having fun because Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. And if anybody should be having fun, it's Christians inside of church. <laughs> there was a pastor who lived a long life, and he died and went to heaven, and he's standing in line at the, the pearly gates. And right in front of him, there's a guy wearing tattered blue jeans, a loud T-shirt, and a leather jacket, and kind of long, curly hair. And, and so uh, this man's standing there waiting for his turn. And St. Pete's there greeting people, and he's got his roster, and he's checking off names. So the man right in front of the pastor steps up to St. Peter, and St. Pete says, tell me your name so I can check my list. And the man goes, oh, I'm Joy Smith, uh, New York taxi cab driver. And uh, St. Pete checks his list and goes, yeah, yeah, sure enough, Joey, you're on the list. And man, you did, you did great. You know what? Here's a golden staff, and this angel is going to take you and show you your heavenly mansion. It's, it's, it's magnificent. Great job. So the pastor's thinking, wow, man, if this taxi cab driver got a golden staff and a mansion, I mean, like, what am I in for? And so he steps up, gives him his name, and said, I was a pastor for 43 years. So Pete looks at his list and goes, yeah, yeah, sure enough, you're on the list. Uh, here you go. Here's your wooden staff. And uh, around the corner down the street there, you'll see your two-bedroom apartment. <laughs> the pastor's taken back, and he goes, hey, that, 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 that's not right. That's not fair. That guy was a taxi cab driver, and he got a golden staff and a mansion. I was a pastor for 43 years, and all I got is this wooden stick and a two-bedroom apartment. And Pete says, hey, up here we reward based on results. Well, you preached, people slept. Well, he drove people prayed. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you know, as we celebrate Easter, there are many high points that most people know. They know about Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. He was a garden in the garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying, not my will, but thy will be done. And many understand that Jesus carried a cross and that he was crucified on Calvary, and that on the third day, we celebrate an empty tomb. But what many people don't know is why. Most people know facts, but they don't understand that the story isn't just for information, but it's truly for transformation. And I want to just take a moment to unpack how amazing, incredible, and life-transforming this story is for you today. And in order to do that, we got to go all the way back to the very beginning, because it all began in a garden. Genesis chapter 1, we see that God created the heavens and the earth, and he created a garden called Eden, and he placed man inside of that garden. And as a good heavenly father, he said, this is what you can enjoy, and these are the things you can have, but there's a boundary that I want to put as a loving heavenly father to protect you, and this is where we pick up. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. See, God is love, and he wanted love in return, but love that's demanded and forced is not love. That's dictatorship. So we had to give man free will, the freedom to choose. Now, researchers tell us that there are over 300,000 fruit-bearing trees. That's a lot of trees. So God said, hey, there's 300,000 plus positive choices you can have, but I'm just going to put a boundary on one, and it's to protect you. Well, if you're out walking one day, and you come across this sign behind you, and you so electric fence, do you get upset and go, man, I can't believe how restricting and narrow-minded the person is that put that up. They're just trying to rob me of a lot of joy and fun. No. You know that that's there to keep you grounded, to keep you safe. If you're driving your car and you're on your path and you come across these signs that say, bridge out, do you get all upset saying, hey, who are you to judge my path? I have the right to choose my way 
And do you just floor it? Now, there's a few people that probably do, but <laughs> for the most part, you go, hey, thank you for the warning, thank you for the heads up, and you detour. Now, if you're thirsty and you come across these bottles and you need to hydrate, do you go, hey, who are you to judge me? It's my body, it's my choice. I, I, I can do what I want. Hey, what's right for you doesn't necessarily have to be right for me. I'm okay, you're okay. I can choose my own morality. No, you go, hey, thank you for the heads up. Why? Are there boundaries? Why are there warning signs to protect us? And this is what God, a good heavenly father did. He goes, hey guys, I got all kinds of things for you to enjoy, but I want to protect you because on the other side of the choice to rebel against me, on the other side of the choice, there's death, there's pain, and there's destruction. Well, we continue with the story. Adam and Eve were out shopping. Now, Adam didn't want to be shopping. He wanted to stay home and watch the game, but his wife made him go. He goes, baby, we're going. Okay. So they're out shopping, and this is where we pick up. And now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. We see Satan using the same lies and tactics today. He hasn't changed the three tools that he has in his toolbox to deceive mankind. Number one, he questions the word of God. Is that really what God said? Is that really what God meant when he said that? He still does that today. Next, we see someone adding to the word of God because God said, thou shalt not eat. But Eve adds, thou shalt not touch. And that's often what religion does. It adds a bunch of rules and regulations to things that God actually never said. And then the third thing is Satan questions the character of God. See, God's holding out on you. He knows that this is the best fruit, that this is the most fun, and hey, you'll be like God. Now, the big deception here was they were already like God. God said, let us make man in our image. He deceived them, and they ate the forbidden fruit. People ask all the time, why is there death? Why is there pain? Why are there so many tragedies inside of the world? Well, insurance companies get it wrong because on their insurance policies, they have the clause, the act of God clause. They're not acts of God. God is good, and everything that God does is good. It's the acts of sin, of evil, and the devil because when mankind chose to rebel against God and ate the forbidden fruit, the knowledge of good and evil, our world is now filled with the knowledge of evil Because we chose to be our own God. We chose to be our own king. We chose to define our own way. And as a result, there's nothing but pain, hurt, and evil inside of the world today. It's not God's fault. It's man's fault. Have you ever thought, I can't wait to meet Adam and Eve. If they get to heaven, I got words for them. Anybody? Like, but before you throw a rock at them, you got to remember, the very thing you're angry at them for doing, we do every day. Because every day that we choose to be our own God, to make our own choices, to live by our own path, we're doing the very same thing that they did. You can't throw a rock at them because we're doing the same thing. Merry Christmas early. (laughs) Then the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made of themselves coverings. This is the first church of the holy fig leaf. First man-made religion, friends, first attempt to cover up their nakedness. When every human being is born, there's this awareness as we grow that something's missing. There's this nakedness, so to speak, that we need to cover. And so we wear all kinds of masks, and we cover it with success, and we cover it with education, and we cover it with the corner office and climbing the corporate ladder and a lavish lifestyle and different things. And we're just simply trying to fill this hole and this void that's in our heart because of what we lost inside of the garden. And that was paradise. And that was the presence of God. And so all of us in some way come out of life just trying to cover up with our own man-made attempts. And God says, hey, that's not going to work. And so God does the the first act of killing an innocent animal, and that was to make clothing for Adam and Eve. And it was simply to show a foreshadowing that there would have to be innocent blood shed for the forgiveness of man and for the restoration of them to be able to be saved again. God did that. Now, when you look at the Old Testament, 
you can really summarize it as pictures and glimpses and shadows of God foreshadowing what he would do to bring us back to paradise, to bring us back into relationship with him. That every little picture and every little story, it's all really pointing to Jesus and what he would ultimately do. I want to show you a really cool one that a lot of people just kind of read over. Have you ever tried to read your Bible and you start in Genesis chapter 1 and you fall asleep in chapter 5? Besides me, I did that like a whole bunch of times. Because you come to this thing called a genealogy. And a genealogy is a really boring list of names. You know, so-and-so begot so-and-so that begot so-and-so that begot yabba-dabba that begot yabba-dabba-do. And you're like, oh, you know. All right. But even inside of something that seemingly insignificant, God put an amazing message. And I want to show you this. We see that Adam's genealogy, the names in Hebrew all have meaning. So we see Adam's name means man. Seth is appointed. Enos, mortal. Canaan, sorrow. Mahelio, the blessed God. Jared shall come down. Enoch, teach. Methuselah, his death shall bring. Lamech, the despairing. Noah, comfort and rest. When you put those names together inside of a sentence, here's literally what God told us. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down. Teaching, his death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. The gospel story was right there inside of a genealogy, a list of names. That yes, because we fell, because we sinned, we had nothing but despair. But God's going to one day come down and he's going to teach us how loved we are. And that his death would one day bring us comfort and rest. Now, we as a human race... We are very good at trying. We're very good at the motto, if it's to be, it's up to me. And so God knew that we would try in our own effort, in our own energy, to try to regain what was lost. But we couldn't do it. Now, I love St. Louis. One of the things I love about St. Louis, it's the only city in the United States of America where all 2.8 million people are saved and going to heaven. Did you know that? It's the only city where everybody's saved. You never meet anybody going to hell, ever. I never have. Have you? Have you? Now, we know New York. Yeah, we know they're going to hell. I mean, like, oh, hey, yeah, splitting it wide open. Like, but St. Louis? Oh, no, we're, we're, we're all going to heaven. I mean, like, you know, the guy that just shot six people, he's going to heaven. And he's, well, I just did everybody a favor. You're welcome. Like, everybody here is saved. Now, one of my favorite things to do, you should try this sometime. It's a lot of fun, is to wreck people's day. Now, that sounds kind of weird coming from a pastor. You're like, what kind of pastor is that? Just, just hang with me. You're going to like this. This is a lot of fun. When you see somebody just having way too much fun, here's how you wreck their day. Hey, let me ask you a question. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven or hell? Oh, it's so awesome just to go, whoa. You just see the blood drain onto their face like, whoa. What a downer. It's, it's, it's so fun. Do you know something? I don't know. Maybe. But if you were to die today, would you go to heaven or hell? <laughs> now, everybody in St. Louis has the same answer. Yes. Have you ever met the person who goes, me? No, splitting hell wide open, extra crispy. No. Now, the second question you always have to follow up with is this. Well, tell me why. And it's the same answer, right? You know it. You've heard it. Because I'm a... All right, let me hear it again. Good person. person. It's the same answer. I'm a good person. Well, good person compared to what? Jeffrey Dahmer? Yeah, maybe you are. (laughs) So God sends Israel a deliverer named Moses. He delivers them from Egypt, takes them out to the wilderness. He climbs up on Mount Sinai. He's up there 40 days. And then he comes down with two tablets of stone we know as the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments was given as a moral compass for every society. It is the greatest foundation and moral compass for a civil society. Without this, there's anarchy. Our country was founded on the Ten Commandments inside of all the government institutions. It was etched in all the buildings. It was published. It was put up in every single classroom, and the Bible was a textbook in every classroom in the 17 and 1800s. It was. And you know what? Things might have been a little better back then when we had a moral compass called the Ten Commandments. Do you think we're doing better today? Without a moral compass? No. But the second reason the Ten Commandments were given was to set a standard to help us know that we could not be good enough 
to get into heaven. Now, I'm going to share a secret that I don't really talk about because I'm a very humble guy. I pride myself in my humility. And um, <laughs> just kidding. I, I am incredibly good at basketball. Now, I'm not as good as I used to be because I'm a little bit older. But uh, when I was younger, I was amazing. In fact, I, I, I should have been scouted by like NBA scouts because I was so good. Now, you look at me and you go, dude, no way. You're 5'10 wearing a salmon jacket. No way. You were good at basketball. Um, I could slam dunk. Like, I was the champion of slam dunking. I could slam dunk in the air. I could do the MJ thing I, behind my back, under my leg. I was crazy good at, at slam dunking the ball. And I never lost a one-on-one -on -one match against my five-year-old son. <laughs> so, like, whenever we were out playing on this baby, I was, like, in the air. I'm slam dunking. Man, my kid didn't know what to do. I was that good. Why? because of the standard by which I measured myself. Right. Now, you put me out on an NBA court with the pros, I would be humiliated. See, the reason you still think you're good and the reason you think you're good enough is you're slam dunking your righteousness on that. <laughs> the reality is that you ever look at somebody and you look at the group of friends they hang out with and you go, why? I'll tell you why because they picked people that make them feel better about themselves. Most people actually don't like their friends. They just make you feel good about yourself. <laughs> because the reality is most of social media exists so you can just find somebody more messed up than you to make you feel good about your day. <laughs> That's what human righteousness is. All we have to do is look around and find somebody that we're better than, and then we feel good. So when somebody goes, are you going to heaven when you die? Yeah, because I'm a good person compared to them. The problem is there's somebody looking at you and pointing to you because they're better than you. But that problem is that's not the standard. That's not what God measures us against. He measures us against his righteousness and his goodness. Heaven's perfect, and he can't let imperfect criminals fill heaven. And so what he had to do is give the standard, which was the Ten Commandments, to go, if you think you can be righteous on your own, then keep this 100% of the time, and he knew we couldn't. Paul said the law was given to be a tutor to bring us to Christ to help us know we can't be good enough. We need a Savior. He was the only one who lived a sinless life. He was the only one who could do what we couldn't do to get us into a heaven we could never get into our own. Now, I know, we got a couple holdouts. You're a little stubborn. You still go, well, I am a pretty good person still. So let's just go through five. We're going to do a little pop quiz. Surprise. All right? Uh, and we're going to do a, a little quiz here. Uh, first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, you might be going, I'm okay there. I don't have Buddha in my living room. But a god is what you look to as your source, what you trust, and what you love the most. St. Louis is God of sports. We love sports. I see you guys out worshiping at this baseball stadium, screaming and yelling, ripping your shirt off. Yeah! Soccer mom, you still have hope that your kid has a chance to do anything in life. Running the wrong way down the field and you're screaming. Like, you know what you trust in and what you love the most, that's your God. So funny to me, people on a sporting event scream it and lose it and you know, shame their sports team in their chest tears. And then they come to church and stand there What's up with that? What if you look like you are in church, like you look, if you brought your football face to your church face, that would be awesome. We'd have a, really a lot of fun and probably a couple of rests. Uh, all right, moving right along, we're going to jump ahead a couple commandments. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with the promise. Now, uh, in the Old Testament, this was actually, if you violated this, kids, you could be put to death. How many parents go... We could use a little more Old Testament. Let's, let's bring that one back. Well, yeah, it sounds great on the surface. Here's the problem. You'd be dead already, Mom and Dad, because your parents would have killed you. You would have never even had a chance to reproduce. <laughs> All right. You shall not commit adultery. That's not just the outward expression. Jesus said if you look at someone to lust after them in your own heart, you commit adultery. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's, that's another way to say that's gossip. Well, I, I, I told the facts. Bearing false witness is the right information with the wrong implication. When you're twisting and shedding things to make you look good by making someone else look bad, that's bearing false witness. And again, we call that social media. You shall not covet. 
If you have credit card debt because you bought a bunch of things that you couldn't afford to impress people whose opinion doesn't matter, congratulations. You get an F. So how you doing? How'd your test go today? Well, you're thinking, man, I'm at 100%. Yeah, we all are. We're at 100% F. We're at 100% failure. We don't even need to go to the other five because we failed those two. See, God didn't give us the law to show that you could be good enough. God gave the law to show you you need Jesus. Now, for a lot of people, they struggle to comprehend God. Because God is so big and so magnificent and so overwhelming. How can we small, finite beings comprehend an incredible God? It's like this ant. Imagine an ant trying to comprehend God. It can't. So what did God do? God said that you can't get to me. You can't comprehend me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to you. And so Jesus took the form of an ant, so to speak. The small, finite, physical, limited body. And he was born of a virgin. And he was placed in a manger. And Jesus split history in half from B.C. to A.D. because we couldn't get to him. God left heaven to come to earth for us. Why would God do that? Well, let's back up for a second. Why would God do that? Because when we think we can be good enough, we can't. Romans 6.23 tells us this, for the wages of sin is death. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. See, the only thing you and I could earn, the only thing you and I could ever deserve on our own is death. Now, death isn't just physical death, but it's spiritual death because Jesus is life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So to be separated from God is to be separated truly from life, spiritual death in a literal, real place called hell. Do you know the Bible references hell over 150 times? Hell's not a metaphor for some evil. Hell is an actual, physical, eternal location separated from the life of God, separated from the presence of God. God didn't create hell for you. God didn't create hell for me. Jesus said hell was created for the devil and his angels. But those that reject God as Satan did. Those that go, I'll be my own God, as Satan did, end up in the same place that was created for Satan. And what makes hell so horrible is that it's the complete absence of all that God is, and God is good. See, hell is eternal darkness because Jesus is the light of the world. You remove Jesus, you have simply darkness. Hell is eternal thirst because Jesus is the living water. Hell is eternal hunger because Jesus is the bread of life. Hell is eternal pain and eternal torment that Jesus describes as weeping and gnashing of teeth because everything good and everything full of life is found in Jesus. And to the person who spends their lifetime shaking their fist at God saying, you will not rule over me. I will have it my way. I don't need you. That person, when they die, God simply grants the prayer they prayed their entire life, and that is, God, I don't want you. God doesn't send anybody to hell. He did everything he can to keep us from there. In fact, he says, the only way you're going to get to hell is you have to step over the dead body of my son, Jesus Christ, to get there. But God will respect your free will and the choice that you make this side of heaven. And that is, if you don't want God in this life, God will allow you to have eternity without life without him. But he did everything he can to keep you from that. When Jesus walked, um, oh, let me finish that. I'm so glad it doesn't end with the wages of sin is death. There's a conjunction there. In fact, it's the most beautiful conjunction in the Bible. It's the word but. It's the prettiest but you'll ever see in life. (laughs) But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't come to give you hell. Jesus came to give you heaven that you and I could never deserve. See, when Jesus took on the form of man, he's 100% God, well, 100% man. And when he walked among us, he came to show us what God the Father was like because we couldn't comprehend God. We couldn't understand. So Jesus said, look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because I only do that which I see my Father do. I only say that which I hear my Father say. And everywhere we see Jesus going around, moving with compassion, loving on hurting people, a leper came to Jesus kneeling, Leprosy was a disease that caused your flesh to literally rot and fingers would fall off and your nose would fall off and you'd literally just die from decay. 
Nobody would touch you. You were an outcast to society. And this person came and knelt before Jesus and said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out and did the unthinkable. He touched the untouchable and said, I'm willing, be clean. And Jesus healed him. Some of you questioned not the power of God, but the willingness of God to touch you. Because maybe your life stinks. Maybe your life is full of sin. Maybe your life is full of so much decay. Jesus says to you, I know your name. I know your story. And I love you. And I want to touch you. And I want to heal you. No matter where you've been in life. And Jesus went around doing good. in healing. and restoring and showing the love of God, and confronting the injustices of the religious system. Jesus did these things. Why? So we could understand him. If you want to know what God looks like, just look at Jesus, because he's the perfect picture of God the Father in earth. Now, there was a group of people that didn't like Jesus. They were the religious leaders, because Jesus didn't fit into their little box. Jesus was wrecking their little plan, and so they wanted to silence the voice of Jesus, just like our culture wants to silence the voice of Jesus in Christianity today, because it's wrecking their plan and doesn't fit into their little box. And so Jesus, knowing he was going to be betrayed, went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he knelt before God the Father, and he said, if at all possible, let this cup pass from me. Why did Jesus pray in a garden? Because Thousands of years earlier, Adam lost it in the garden. He bombed in the garden. We lost salvation in the garden. Jesus would regain it in another garden. See, Adam said, my will be done. But in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus would bear a crown of thorns upon his head because after Adam sinned, God said, cursed is the ground because of you. It will bear thorns and thistles. And by the sweat of your brow, you're going to produce a living So by the sweat of Jesus' brow, he sweat blood in the garden to redeem us from the curse. He would bear a crown of thorns upon his head to redeem us from the curse that Adam brought because of sin. We lost it in the garden. Jesus regained it in another garden. He was arrested. He was brought before the Pharisees, was given a legal religious trial, mock trial, brought before Pontius Pilate. The people stirred up the crowd to shout, we won't have this man rule over us. Away with him, crucify him. Pilate had him flogged and beaten. A crown of thorns was crushed into his skull, and he was forced to carry his cross. Well, his back bled from the flogging. He carried his cross to Calvary, and there he was crucified. They drove nails into his wrists and into his feet, and they would lift him on a wooden cross, and there would be a hole in the ground about three feet deep. And as that cross was lifted up, it would drop three feet down into the ground, and it would make a thud, and the criminals and those on a cross, all their joints and tendons would tear as the weight of their body came down upon the nails. And from that cross, the crowd was mocking him. They shouted, you saved others, why don't you save yourself? He didn't come to save himself. He came to save you. From that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You put me on a cross, I got some words. It's probably not forgive them. I'm not Jesus. Don't judge me, Snow White. Said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then we see, then as the sun darkened, and as Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. I can only imagine all those that followed Jesus for the three and a half years thinking he's the Messiah, he's going to save Israel, he's going to overthrow the Roman Empire, he's going to restore Israel to its glory. I can only imagine the broken heart as they watched their Savior, their Messiah, die. Defeat set in. The fog of despair set in as they saw their hope breathe his last breath. They took the broken, bloodied body of Jesus and they placed it in a tomb. Hell thought he won. Satan thought he triumphed by killing Jesus. In 1815, all of England lay in fear and trepidation because Napoleon was on a rampage conquering Europe. And England knew it was just a matter of time before he would make his way to England and take over their empire. England's last hope was a general named Wellington. And if Wellington could not defeat Napoleon... They knew England was lost. It was just a matter of time. So all England was in fear and trepidation, waiting for news of the outcome of the battle between Wellington and Napoleon. 
Finally, late in the afternoon, a ship in the harbor fired a cannon to send the relay message, and the first word was Wellington. Moments later, the second word was defeated. And just then, a fog rolled in and covered the ships. Well, word began to spread like wildfire all through England, Wellington defeated. They're in panic, they're in fear, they know that, that Napoleon's going to come and conquer them and pillage them, and they're panicked. But then after a moment, the fog lifted, and another cannon signal was sent to get their attention because there was a third and final word, and that was Napoleon. Altogether, the message was, Wellington defeated Napoleon. What a difference that third word made. See, Satan thought that he defeated Jesus on the first day. Satan thought he defeated Jesus on the second day. But there was a third and final day. There was a third and final word where Jesus defeated the devil. Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave. And when we come together, that's what we celebrate, the third and final day. And now the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they entered and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they'd prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them, shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen. Of all the religious founders tombs today. You can go to their tomb and the body's still there. Muhammad's still there. Buddha's still there. Confucius is still there. There's one tomb that's empty and one tomb alone, and that is the tomb of the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. There's one little other footnote that I want to read that just adds so much to the story. And it's found in the Gospel of John, and a lot of times we just read over this and we miss something amazing. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And when he saw the linen cloth lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together by a place in itself. There's something important in that meaning. Because when Jesus was resurrected, he literally took the time to fold the napkin that was on his head, fold it, and lay it, separately from the rest of the, the grave clothes. Why? Well, in that day, there was a custom inside of a wealthy person's home. As the wealthy person would be sitting to dine, the attendants would be standing outside of the corner waiting for the head of the house to finish their meal. And the way they knew that the meal was finished was when the, the head of the house would take the napkin, wipe their face, crumple it up, throw it down on their plate, they would walk away, then the attendant knew they were done and they could come and clear. But if the head of the house took the napkin, neatly folded it, and set it by the plate, the attendant knew he was coming back. He wasn't done. Jesus folded the napkin, ladies and gentlemen, because he's coming back. And the question day is, are you ready for when Jesus comes back? I'm not finished, I'm gonna come back here in just a moment, but I wanna say a prayer over you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these amazing people who came to celebrate Easter. Many just came because somebody invited them. They're not even necessarily sure why they're here, but you know why they're here. You orchestrated their path to be here, to be intersected with the message of your divine love and your grace and mercy in the person of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would draw people to accept and to receive the greatest gift of all, the gift of salvation through Jesus. Touch their hearts, open their minds to fully understand how loved they are by you. It's in Jesus' name, amen.
Precious blood has left me forgiven Pure like the whitest of snow Powerful to make sin and shame a retreat This covenant is making me whole So I will rise and lift my head For by His mercy my life was spared The highest name has set me free Because of Jesus my heart is clean purify my heart in your presence teach me to discover the joy of holiness that forms as you draw me close in you what was lost is restored so i will rise and lift my head for by his mercy my life was spared the highest name has set me free because of jesus my heart is clean so I will rise and lift my head for by his mercy my life was spared the highest name has set me free because of Jesus my heart is clean because of Jesus, my heart is clean. Let's all stand together and worship.
There was a moment when the lights went out. When death had claimed its victory. It was my sin that held him there. It was my sin that held him there. It was my there. sin that held him there. His dying breath has His brought dying me life. Breath I, has know brought that me it is I know that it is finished. That it is finished. The cross has spoken. I am the cross has spoken. The cross has spoken. The cross has spoken. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. Then bursting forth in glorious day, day great to the world, and so you give life, you give life and so one miraculous breath, and you give life forever. You give life as perfect as the hand of God, 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 as the hand of God. There will be a day when all will bow before him. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. I can only imagine what it would be like when I walk by your side I can only imagine what my eyes will see where your face is before me I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak? I 
Just take a moment, bow your head, close your eyes just one more time. I can only imagine. When you stand before Jesus Christ, and you will, because we all will, can you imagine what it is you'll say when he asks, what did you do with my sacrifice, with my gift for you? The Bible says if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Salvation is a prayer away. Think of all the things that you've done in your life to try to find happiness, to try to find meaning, to try to find significance, and it hasn't worked. There's still a void, there's still a hole because it's a God-sized hole that only Jesus can fill. I'd love to lead you in a prayer right there where you are of accepting the gift of this Savior. You don't clean up your life to come to Jesus. You come to, your, to Jesus just as you are. He'll clean you up. But you just come as you are. He's not afraid of your mess. He died for your mess. He loves you. Maybe you've known him, but you're wandered. You're away. You've strayed today. He's not angry at you. In fact, he leaves the 99 as a good shepherd to go find the one that's lost. He loves you, and his arms are open wide, ready to receive you today. Would you join in with us as we pray this prayer right there? God's listening. God's going to answer. Would you say this? Let's say this together, church. Jesus, Jesus, thank you you. that because I couldn't get to you, you you left heaven heaven to come to me. me. You hung on a cross cross that should have been mine. mine. You took my sins sins. and you paid for them them. with your death. death. You rose from the dead on the third day so you could fill my empty heart. I confess you as my Savior and you as my Lord. I give my life to follow you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Church, let's give him a big hand clap. Come on, church. I think he's worthy of one more praise. Thank you, Jesus the greatest news we could ever hear. You've changed everything. You're holy. You're mighty. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You guys can be seated for just a moment here. As Pastor Eric closed out the message and provided the opportunity to to say that prayer along with him, maybe for you, you've been distant from God. You know you've been running from him. He's been knocking on your heart. You said that prayer and it came from a genuine place. Maybe you haven't had a relationship with God at all. That was the first time you had ever said that prayer. Uh, First and foremost, church, how do we feel about people giving their heart to the Lord for the first time? Amen. That's why the church exists, partly. But here's the deal. We don't want to just help usher people into a relationship with God and say, all right, figure it out. Hope it goes well. We want to come alongside you as the church. And so you can text I decided to the number on the screen. What this will allow for is you'll get a free seven-day devotional. And this is just our way of saying, hey, we we want to come alongside you as you begin this journey with Jesus, and it's going to change everything. Amen. Do you believe that? Yeah. Uh, 
right from this week, we'll move into a pretty exciting series. We're going to title it, Know God. And that's a play on words there. Because although there's elements of our faith that require believing without seeing, uh, we do believe that we can look into history and statistics, even factually, and there are things where uh, I, I think it would only increase and help our faith. Things that we have to confront and say, okay, that's only God. That's only God. I, I can't deny that. And so this series is going to be really good as we tackle some of those things. It'll help solidify the faith that many of us already have or we're believing it'll catalyze someone believing, okay, I see it and open up their heart in a unique way. So I don't want to just invite you. I want to invite you to invite somebody else with you, specifically someone who may be struggling in their faith. We believe that this will minister to them. So, um, hey, weekends like this, uh, they don't happen with without one, a great volunteer team. How about the team worship? Uh, just Pastor Eric's message, incredible. Our greeters, our ushers, everybody, kids, uh, we're, we're so grateful for them. But these events don't happen without the faithful tithes and offering of all of you. And so if you've given online this week already, we want to say thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your generosity. If that doesn't pertain to you, we'll have ushers at every door at the end of service. You can free, uh, feel free to give there. Uh, we also have multiple ways you can participate, all of which are safe and secure. Uh, I, I do want to mention another great way to get connected here at the church to contribute is to make time to attend our Connect class. I'm telling you, I mentioned this at the beginning of service. Whether you've been at Element for a long time or you're brand new today, our Connect class is for you. We're going to talk about uh, kind of the foundation of Element Church, our, our core values, our core beliefs. Maybe you're here and you're like, I'm not really sure what you guys believe about this. Or you'll have the unique opportunity in this Connect class to ask some of those questions, to grow. And, and more importantly, you'll connect with God. You'll connect with the church. It's for you, okay? That's a two-session, two-part class. First session is April 21st. Second is April 20. Okay? Hey, as always, uh, I know we can come into Easter service and we look good and we'll probably take a cute family picture and our outfits look nice, but maybe we're really walking through something beneath all that. And I, I just want to make y'all aware that we're going to have our prayer team down here in the front after service. And if you are walking through something and you could use prayer, come on, the God we serve, he heals. The God we serve, he restores. The God we serve provides joy when it seems like depression is crippling. Come on, when, we, when the people of God come together and pray, powerful things happen. Here at Element Church, we just believe in the power of prayer, and so we prioritize it. I want to invite you, if that's you, if you're walking through something, take advantage of our prayer team, okay? Would you guys mind to stand to your feet? I want to speak a blessing over you before we dismiss for the morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Element Church, happy Easter. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for being with us.
Spirit.